So first of all, um, who are we? So <laughs> we're located in Vineland. We've been here for over, uh, oh my goodness, 45 uh, years in operation as a charitable status, but um, uh, Kay McKeever, our founder, started it uh, quite a while ago, about over 60 years. Um, so we have also a population of foster residents as well as work with rehabilitated uh, birds of prey. Um, our goals, of course, is to provide the highest care we possibly can um, for medical care, nutrition, and housing. So each of these species sometimes have uh, preferred um, habitat types, and we try to accommodate that while they're here. Um, and we are very concerned about mental stress. So these are wild animals, um, so that's why we're not open to the public. Um, so we want to make sure that the time here, whether they're permanent or just passing through, um, that we provide a stress-free environment as much as possible. Um, and then we also network with other rehab centers. We work closely with quite a few uh, rehabbers uh, across the province. Um, often they do the triage and then they send them up to us um, for uh, continued care for rehabilitation for um, flight uh, stamina and strength um, exercises. Um, but sometimes if they're just more complex cases that they're just not comfortable with, um, they'll send them along. And of course, like we're doing today, we're educating. Um, so in order to do what we do, you do have to have a permit with the Ministry of um, Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Um, so we actually hold uh, permits to do what we do here. Uh, and again, just to reiterate, we're not open to the public just for the you know, safety and, and um, mental health of the birds. Um, and, uh, you know, we've been here for quite some time. Um, so the things that we're able to do on site, um, we're able to immobilize fractures, um, manage wounds, uh, do food therapy, uh, emaciation recovery is uh, the word emaciation is referred to a burden extreme weight loss. Um, and so that often affects the organ systems. And so it takes special um, treatment and care in order to get them to recover from uh, that state. Um, we um, are able to provide them with me medications uh, for appropriate um, care and management of their illnesses or diseases. Um, we can do basic diagnostic like blood work um, and uh, we perform physiotherapy as well. Um, not one of their favorite uh, <laughs> procedures that involves a lot of hands-on um, and the convalescent care, so recovery uh, after loss of, uh, of uh, muscle mass just from um, being treated in a small confined space. They need to get back to being fit and then the release training. So just to overview what exactly is rehabilitation is, you know, the goal is to return back to um, normal fitness and health um, to regain strength. Um, and for birds, like for animals in particular, um, we also want them to be fully functional. So we want them to be able to find their own food, uh, like to be able to get it and to avoid danger. So it's not like human rehabilitation where you can have some tools to support you in your disability. Um, for us, for these wild animals, we want them to be fully functional and going back to the wild. Um, if it's in uh, a situation where we have baby orphaned animals, uh, they may not be dealing with an injury, um, but we want to make sure that they um, are raised in such a way that they are fully functional mentally, as well as able to provide um, the skills they need to be able to hunt and manage their own lives when they get returned to the wild. So we want to make sure that they're able to hunt and recognize their own actual food sources that they're used to having for that species. So now we're going to some owl basics. So what does an owl look like? Um, so they do have this beautiful sharp curved beak. Um, I have a skull here of a couple of different species um, that you can see um, a little bit more than just in a picture. So they have that nice sharp curved beak. Um, they have beautiful talons. Where did I put my foot? Sharp curved talons with nice points on them to help capture their prey. And owls in particular have very forward facing eyes. Um, their eye sockets are more forward uh, than off to the side. And so, so that's what a typical owl looks like. And what do they do? Well, they are carnivores. And so they're what you would call an obligate carnivore. They cannot get their nutrition from any kind of vegetation. Um, so they have to consume um, uh, another animal that carries a lot of protein and, 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 um, and so uh, they eat a variety of things. So some of our species love to eat insects. Uh, reptiles, uh, rodents, uh, other birds, uh, as well as uh, small mammals. Um, so a lot of us, people assume that when they think owl, they think always uh, uh, um, active at night. 
Um, but there are some that have different preferences. So there is uh, different depending on the species, what they actually like. So if they're primarily um, they're considered to be nocturnal, if they're active during the day, which we do have a few that are comfortable with movement during the daytime and doing hunting activities in the daytime, they're called diurnal. And if they prefer low level lighting, like dusk and dawn, they're called crepuscular. And there's some that kind of depending on the season and what the needs are, they kind of fluctuate depending on what he's looking to do. Uh, another thing uh, is that they have a range of hunting styles. And so you have owl species that love to hover over a field and, and stay stationary and kind of listen over a, a field for prey items. There's some that love to chase and, and there's some that actually just like to sit in a tree and just wait for an opportunity and then just scoop down and catch their prey that way. So they have a variety of different styles of how they like to catch their food. Um, and then um, they have amazing abilities to blend into their environment. Um, they have camouflage. So you can see from the few pictures on the screen, um, they blend in really well. So when all these people are saying, I've never seen an owl in the wild. Well, they're in your backyards. They're in downtown Toronto. They're in parks and small parks. They're there. It's just that they blend so well and they really don't like us. So they want to stay hidden. Um, they're hard to see. So we've actually circled uh, in the picture on your screen on would be your bottom left. Um, these are a couple of short eared hiding. There's actually two in there. And so you can just imagine if you're out going on a nature walk, why you miss seeing them. Um, they also make really cool sounds. So typically um, when you have an owl making a call, you imagine it sounding like this. But they can also make really cool sounds like this. Or this. Or even this. And this. So they do have a variety of different calls depending on the species. But even within that species, there's different calls for different reasons. And that's a really long tooting sawwet. So we'll, get, we'll move forward with that one. Um, another thing that uh, they do, which is uh, really advantageous for nighttime flying, um, is that they fly silently. So depending on the species, some are very stealthy, very quiet. Some you can hear a bit of a flutter, but mainly most of them are quite silent. And it's thanks to the adaption of their feathers. So their feathers actually on the top surface of their feathers, um, they have a, a bit of a pile, like a fluff. And so when the feathers are moving across each other, it kind of muffles the sound. So it's like if you put two papers, pieces of paper together, you kind of hear them shifting. So this kind of muffles the sound. And they, on the leading edge of their feathers, so if you guys are doing like this one, so on that leading edge right here is they actually have serrations. And if you know anything about physics and wind turbulence, it creates little wind eddies to help break up the sound. So it, as it's flapping, it actually reduces that, um, those air tur turbulence to actually make it fly silently. Um, and they have really cool abilities um, to um, look around in their environment. Um, so they have very, very flexible necks. Um, and um, they love to explore their environment by swiveling that head around and uh, so you can see that that owl could go a little further. So back and forth. So you thought, wow, that's pretty flexible. And all of a sudden she goes even further to check behind her. And you can see in the picture of the two younger horned owls, the great horned owls on the far left, if you notice their bodies, one actually has the tail facing us, but the head is turned around facing us. And the other one is forward. So you see the chest of the bird and the head. One on the left, you can see that his back is completely to us and his head is swiveling around. So the reason why they can do that, they have very flexible necks. Um, they actually, um, almost like a ball and socket point your shoulder. Um, and they also have very, very long necks. And it's really hard to see because there's all of these feathers in the way, but there is a neck hidden in there and I'll show you a skeleton. This is just to give you an example of what our abilities are, which are <laughs> very limited compared to what uh, an owl can do. So if you see the skeleton, how long that neck is, and it's usually sitting in more of an S shape. So it's even more squat down on the body typically than what the skeleton taxidermy has positioned this neck as. Um, and so that's why it gives them the semblance that they have no neck. And so it even makes it even creepier when they swivel their head around. It's just almost like, you know, some kind of horror movie that's happening here. 
another thing they do is um, is uh, that they actually don't actually have a crop. So most birds will have this uh, expansion in their um, esophagus that kind of is a food storage. And even our diurnal hawks have that, like red tail hawks and little kestrels, they'll have this pouch. And so this is kind of like a way that they can kind of beef up on food and then slowly take time to digest it. Well, owls don't have this crop. And so um, they tend to do a lot of quick consumptions and consumptions in their full, uh, food and food. And, uh, and so once it goes down to the stomach, um, what happens is that as the stomach is moving around, uh, the enzymes come in and dissolve all the, the, the nutrients that are in the, in the prey item, but anything that can't be broken down like bone and feathers and fur actually get compacted into what you call a pellet. And we're actually hoping that it's open this later if we have time. Um, so that's what a pellet looks like when it um, comes out. Um, and what's neat about these pellets is that they're a very useful tool for biologists because they can actually open these pellets and look at what prey items that that species in particular predominantly likes to take in, out of the environment. And so if this was an endangered species, um, like we do have um, some threatened species like short eared they can take a bunch of these pellets and look at what species that they prefer to eat in, in larger quantities. And so they look at maybe say, you know, 50 pellets and they're looking at 40% of them are coming from species of mouse or vole, they can then look at the environment and say, okay, well, where does this vole live? What does this vole need to survive and what habitat it likes to live in? And then you can preserve that habitat over other habitats that may not have that um, species of animal that they like to hunt. Um, so it's a very useful tool. And a lot of people are probably like, oh, this is gross. <laughs> Um, but um, these lovely biologists are so good at what they do, they can take uh, a skull and some of the skeletal pieces and be able to ID the animal down to um, exact species. Um, so not just the genus group, but the whole, you know, this is the red back bull versus the white footed mouse versus the short tailed true. Um, they can identify these skulls. Um, so this is what it looks like when they're casting. Um, so usually they do this before a meal. It takes about 12 to 24 hours from them uh, consuming a, a, a prey item to them evacuating a pellet. Another cool thing that they do is that they have a very good night vision and it's thanks to very, very large eyes. Uh, the eyes actually take quite a little, a lot of the skull area. Um, so if you were to um, kind of um, ratio us down, so relative to our, their skulls, if we were to have similar size eyes, they would be the size of like, um, actually, eat my grapefruit. So, so if I had owl eyes, they would look, this is an advantage of not eating your lunch. Um, they would actually be about this size in your skull. So you can just imagine um, carrying those around that they would actually be quite heavy. Um, so owls actually have, most birds actually have this uh, feature in their eyes uh, is this bony structure here, this sclerotic ring actually helps support the eye. And because the eye is actually tubular, it's actually not able to move around in the skull. And so that's why they're constantly moving their heads because their eyeballs don't move. So in order to view their environment, they're constantly swiveling their head around. Another cool thing that they do is detection of sound. Um, so, um, you know, they're, they're like ideal stealth bomber. Um, so they actually have that nice silent flight, but still need to be able to hear the prey as they're moving around and in, 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 up in the air. And so they have these amazing um, uh, feathers around their ears that are specialized, that are a little stiffer, that help them um, kind of, um, they, they vibrate and tickle the ear chamber. Um, and uh, depending on the owl species, um, they have different size ear openings. And so when you look at the ear openings, they're always on the side of the head. So just because on this picture, you see these feather protrusions, those are not feather protrusions um, that uh, relate to their ears. That's more to look at um, behavioral uh, signals to, and also to blend in more to the environment. So they look more like bark or trees, but they do use them to signal behavior, um, but their ear openings are on the side. Um, and so as you see in the next picture, um, so the little screech owl on the left side um, has a bit of a smaller aperture, um, whereas the short-eared owl, has a quite a large aperture with a larger skin flap. And so they're very good at detecting sound. And if you think about how, where they live, whereas females live in a more forested setting where the ground cover is not as deep, whereas uh, the short-eared loves uh, 
fields, grasses and um, prairie grasses and stuff like that. So they're having to listen for prey items that are further deep into the grassy area. So they may not be able to see it, but they can hear it. So they need to have very acute um, sound perception. Some owl species, not many, even go so far as to actually change the skull shape so that one ear is lower than the other. And so um, how this works is that as they're manipulating their head to listen to sound, so when that sound comes equally to both ears at the same time, they can kind of triangulate and position their heads to where they think the sound's coming from. And they do that by having that altered ear position. Um, where they live, owls are amazing. They live in every single continent except the two poles. Um, and they have a variety of diverse habitats that they can actually um, take, take into account. Um, but they're a bit lazy when it comes to nesting opportunities. They actually don't build any nests. They take over nests or they're satisfied with just a ledge or a scrape. So some of them will do just a divot, um, very little like nest maintenance. Um, sometimes part of their courtship ritual is to maybe do a little bit of maintenance or just to kind of present it differently, but really doesn't, uh, they would not be considered nest builders at all. Um, and so um, they often are taking over existing nests or just tree snags. Um, amazing parents. Um, they um, are very dedicated parents. So their babies are born helpless. Um, which is called ultracial. And so they need to be kept warm. So part of mom's job is to sit on the babies, keep them warm and sheltered. Dad brings in food. Um, when the babies start developing and getting bigger, um, sometimes dad is allowed to direct feed, but mom's very watchful and she's very, you know, um, potential intervene is, oh, no, no, they're not quite ready for cold prey or to tear up prey. I'm going to take over and bring it up. Sometimes dad's a little eager and tries to deliver the feed. Um, but once they are starting to what we call branch out, when they become branchers, um, then dad is fine to deliver directly. And so often when she might still have babies in the nest, because sometimes, especially if they have more eggs, um, like there's some species that will lay seven to eight eggs, um, you'll have a uh, quite a diversity in age and development. And so while these ones are ready to start practicing and flapping, dad can take care of these and mom can still focus on the ones on, on the nest. And both are very protective. So both are involved in defense and guarding um, the, the, the nest and the babies as they're learning to develop and fly. So a lot of people always ask me, well, how do I find them? Um, so one of the, the key challenges is that they don't want to be found and they have extremely good hearing. So they know you're coming and approaching before you could even spot them. So they're often going into a defensive posture where they're trying to blend in, look very skinny, um, and not want to be seen. Um, some of the ways that you can look is the evidence that at some point that they did um, roost there, they may have casted a pellet there. So you can look at the ground for evidence of a pellet. Um, and so typically they may be perched in the tree. And then, so if you look below any of these trees, you might see a pellet and you may not see the bird today, but it be, might be worth it um, to kind of investigate those areas for a couple of days in a row because you might happen to catch them. Uh, on a, a different day um, and look closely at the tree trunks um, because they will want to be closer to the tree trunks or if it's an evergreen tree, they may be in a more ideal branching area that they can still kind of keep an eye on things, but they can be well hidden. Um, and then listening to, to their calls um, in the evening or low dusk uh, light conditions because that's when they tend to do most of their calls, not to say that they won't call during the day, um, but that's just uh, more opportunity frequently to um, catch a sound from them and then be patient um, you know um, be respectful and sometimes you can get a, a glimpse of these amazing birds out in the environment so in the middle there you can actually see the back of the great horned owl um, so we just want to touch base we'll go through these really quickly no one likes to be preached at but it's one of the things that we feel is so important um, to be respectful for owls because anytime you're altering behavior anytime you're present and they're looking at you they're aware of you and so we just want to go through very quickly you know making sure you're not trespassing the property we hear a lot of people you know walking into a, a farmer's field you know they really don't want their their fields trampled, um, so be respectful. Um, there's some legislation that are now protecting um, species in your area, so you might want to check in for bylaws, um, especially um, some of the parks are actually taking an extra step uh, in protecting some 
a particular famous, uh, what they call famous owls, um, if they're spotted. Um, so just, you know, be, be aware. Um, and then be familiar with your species that you're trying to spot. Because, um, you know, if you're looking for a particular species, but then there's a predator nearby, you want to be very careful that you're not going to disturb them, switch them out, and then leave them at predation. Um, and recognizing the signs of stress. So what does stress look like in these birds? Um, so like I said, if you are interrupting a bird's behavior, whether it be resting, feeding, hunting, then you're too close and you need to back away. Um, and just because it's hunting, you think like, oh, well, it's busy hunting. Well, you might ruin that successful hunt if you're too close. Um, so it's always best to stay back or, or um, you know, just leave them be and, and move on. Uh, and never force an action, uh, never startle, never pursue, never prevent escape. Um, visiting known roost sites uh, should be kept to a minimum, like take your, your view and then leave somebody else an opportunity to quickly view and move on. So if everybody kind of does the same thing, then you won't get these mobbing effects um, occurring. Um, and then if you're going to use vocalizations, just remember you are altering behavior. You are causing this bird to be on alert and perhaps even to call back. Um, to be thinking, oh no, there's somebody in my territory and I need a nesting area or my hunting grounds. So when you use a vocalization, you are disrupting the bird's behavior. And um, birds in nature, any animal in nature, their, their goal is to find food, breed, produce young, and move on. And they, and they have certain energy um, that gets spent during all these activities. And so if they're wasting energy on you, then they might lose energy for some of these important um, aspects of their lives. Um, and do, do, not, do not disturb nesting owls. Um, it may delay food delivery. Owls may become aggressive uh, and never get in between offsprings and parents. And so don't be fooled. They are watching. So even if it looks sleeping and the eyes are closed, <laughs> they're not. They're slitted. And they're just keeping an eye on you and making sure you're not going to do anything funny. Um, so they, they are concerned when, when, when you're in the environment. And then with owl photography, just making sure, um, you know, that you're always uh, cognizant. Sometimes if you're behind the lens, forget to actually look at what you're doing and looking at the behavior of the bird. Um, and always, if it's a nest site, you know, set up a blind, um, use a telephoto lens. And again, like if there's already tons of photographers there, please move on. They don't need another person there. So this is an example of a blind. Sometimes actually people, if they have them nesting in their backyard, they actually will uh, plant um, like fast growing uh, vines or, or bean plants and create a natural blind. Um, so that by the time the kids are starting to explore, you've got this really nice cool uh, natural blind. So you can even consider doing that if you have them in your backyard um, using a telephoto lens. And then again, not mobbing. Never bait or lure. So we're very big proponents of not providing food for any wildlife. Um, and, uh, so it's just, you know, there's no question, don't do it. Um, so a lot of times you're introducing a, a non-native species. Um, and also this poor bird was going after this jarred mouse over and over and over and over and over again and not having success. And so he's wasting energy, um, consuming a lot of energy, trying to go for this animal that he could never get. Um, sometimes it, uh, habituates them to roadsides and leaves um, reduces fear of humans. We're not all nice. Um, and also too, somebody might think that this bird is being aggressive when he's just a habituated bird. Um, so it leaves him at risk for being harmed. Um, also a false sense of success. So if you are baiting for a short period of time and he decides, hey, this is a great place to live. I'm going to, you know, start nesting here. And then when you stop delivering food, um, there's actually a natural low in this and that they couldn't sustain having another pair breeding in that area, then uh, they might have a failed nest. Um, and then it doesn't challenge them. It's an easier prey item. The prey item is not going to know how to avoid predation. And so it kind of makes them a little lazy. Um, and also too, it causes them to hunt at different times that would normally not be their time to hunt. And it actually may aggravate um, uh, predator prey relationships as well, because just because it's a predator doesn't mean that it has competition that could prey upon them. And then in some municipalities, like I said, they're finally stepping up that it's actually illegal to provide food uh, to wildlife. So, you, you know, it's great to hear that uh, they're, they're stepping up for wildlife. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to go through a couple of life histories. And I just wanted to, before we do the bit of life histories, is that animals are adaptable and they change their characteristics of what they like to do or how often they like to do things based on pressures of nature. 
And so uh, these pressures are like environmental changes, if natural disasters occur, uh, weather pattern changes, if prey density changes, um, habitat availability is going to change how they use their environment. And if they're going to choose to settle or not settle, how much young they're going to have versus how, how little. Um, so these are factors that change, you know, these, these um, what they call these life histories of the bird. A great resource is called eBird.org, and it's an organization that's moderated by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and it's constantly updating their information. And there's a cool uh, feature of this is where you can actually go and click on this website and actually choose a species. And so I'm going to choose barred owl range map. And this is just an example of how barred owls are actually now seeing more frequently in southern regions of, uh, of uh, Ontario where they weren't before. So this is a range map of North America. The purple is where they're seen year round. And then we're looking at data before 2010. So before 2010, you'll see the purple and the density of the density of the purple is kind of indicates where they're seen more frequently. And you can see in southern Ontario, there's hardly any barred owls kind of present and seen in this in this area. But now if you look in the past 10 years, you're seeing that increase. So that purple density is showing that there's people spotting them more frequently in Southern Ontario, whereas they weren't before. And so again, habitat changes, more fragmented forests, um, you know, there's so many reasons why it may change. But when you just decide to look at just a couple of months um, in June, in June and July, there is actually still not a lot of birds showing up in Southern Ontario. The same thing, the past 10 years, they're still not present. So what we think we're seeing in these previous maps is a lot of juvenile dispersal, moving, looking for a territory and temporarily kind of hanging out in Southern Ontario. And then if they're not finding the right habitat and the right needs, they're moving on either heading south because there's bird owls that exist south of us um, or moving to the uh, east or north of us. So that's, uh, you know, just a fun little way you can look at data. Um, so we're going to visit the, just briefly on, you know, all us, we're classified. So to classify species, we have all these fun little categories. Um, and so we're all part of the kingdom Animalia. We are a part of the phylum Chordata, which means we have a backbone, a spinal. Um, but then we break it down. Um, we're mammals, they're birds. And then we can break it down even further. And we're looking at the genus Bubo and Tido for looking at our species. And we have a few relationships. Um, so um, we have um, just from one family, we have the barn owls. But in the Strigidae family, we have quite a few that are in southern Ontario, but we have some cousins. Um, so the boreal owl and the north and saw owl are closely related. And you can kind of see the similarities in the shape of their bodies. And then in the genus Asia, we have our long-eared owl and our short-eared owls. So a little similar in their uh, stature. So they're both medium sized birds, but they behave completely different in their environments. Um, and then for Bubo, we have the great horned owl and the snowy owl. And we're going to visit these more closely as we move forward. And in Eastern Screech Owl is all by himself. And the bird owl is uh, got a cousin, the great gray owl. And then the uh, hawk owl is all by himself. So we're just gonna focus on our Southern owls today with the occasional sightings that we have. So for Southern owls, we have our screech owls, we have our great horned owls, we have our long-eared owls, we have our Northern sawwet owls, and we have our short-eared owls. For occasional sightings, we have our barred owl, we have our barn owl, which the population is very small, so it's very infrequent that we can see them, and our snowy owls. And so snowy owls are mostly seen in the winter months. Um, so this is just a page that you can uh, get from any kind of bird book, but I just told uh, chose Sibley just because it has this lovely image. So you can get an idea of the size range. So we have some really small little saw wet owls that are about this big, and then we go all the way up to the bigger owls, which I can't find room for that. <laughs> so, um, so we're going to start with our little sawwet owl. So our sawwet owl is uh, a smallest one that we have in Ontario. And uh, so, but what's really cool about them, they actually have an adult plumage and a um, juvenile plumage. So the picture above is what the juveniles look like. And what's interesting is that they have this plumage when they first um, get their first set of uh, feathers, um, but then immediately change by September to the adult plumage that you see below. 
Um, they're very nocturnal, um, but not to say that they won't have some activity during the day. So especially in the winter months, if you're down here, if food is kind of harder to come by, you might see them a little bit more active during the day, but their preferred time is nocturnal. Right, so they actually like the ship. So um, they do like to breed north of us, um, but we're seeing more evidence that they're breeding in more of southern area. So it depends, again, pressures, competition, and we'll make some change, um, you know, what their preferences are. Um, and then we have uh, the fact that they do not pair for life. Um, so they're, they, they'll they pair up for the season, but they may not enjoy the same partner next year. Um, and they produce quite a bit of eggs. Um, they prefer more of a forested habitat. Um, and uh, their breeding's between March and July, but they like cavities. So they're a little harder to find uh, when they're nesting. Um, and they prefer small prey items. Um, they will eat birds as well as uh, small rodents. And they prefer to hunt from a perch, um, not to say that they won't hover as well. Um, and I had migratory twice, that wasn't very good of me. So we're gonna listen to um, a call here. So that was a call we heard before. So this is what we often hear when they're trying to kind of, you know, announce that they're here, maybe deter anybody else from coming. This food begging call, so I'm just gonna stop this call. Um, this is actually the call that kind of gave them their name, saw wet. So saw wet, wetting a saw is sharpening a saw. And often when you're sharpening, this is the sound it kind of produces. And that's why they were named the saw wet owl because they would hear this call. And this is a call that we only hear during the breeding season uh, when they're trying to offer food or announce food's arrival. Um, but I'm not 100% sure that that's the only time they actually produce this call, but it's often hear what we hear for, for that call. Um, now we have the Eastern Screech Owl, so that's a little bit bigger than a, a Sawwet Owl. And these guys like to be more a dusk and dawn activity level, um, but these guys are sedentary. So once you establish themselves in your backyard, it will often be the same pair over and over again. And they will um, also kind of ward off any birds all year round. So they'll stay in that same area all year round. Um, they partner up, so they're monogamous. So they get married and they basically maintain that bond throughout the season. Um, they have a couple of different color uh, morphologies. And so the more common that we see is gray, but we also have the red and in between brown. Um, they like woodland habitats, um, small wooded areas, small parks. Like I said, these guys, especially in older parts of the cities where you have lovely lined oak trees, you might have every third driveway. You might have one sitting in an oak tree or have a, a cavity with a family in there. Um, so uh, they do very well in urban settings. Um, they um, prefer a cavity. Um, breeding March to May. But again, this fluctuates depending on food availability, temperatures, um, what's, you know, what, what uh, type of partnership they have with their, their, their mates. So if they're an established pair, they might go a little earlier. Um, they prey on rodents, small birds, and invertebrates. They love June bug season. Often when the birds come into care, their first casted pellet is often um, June bug legs and, and things in, in May and June. Um, same time, sometimes butterfly wings. Um, they mainly hunt from perches. Um, again, they do well in urban settings. And so here are some of the calls that they make. This sounds like a ghost to me. So I don't know if that would be something really creepy around a campfire, a little, uh, little ghosting. And this is what they're known for is that lovely screech. This is when they're upset or distressed or, you know, so it's not a happy call. And then we have the long eared owl. I always find that these are look like mini great horned owls. Um, so, but they're a medium sized owl species. They're very nervous. Um, so, they do like to be well hidden. Um, they often are uh, extremely nocturnal. They are migratory. Um, so, they do make uh, seasonal movements. And they often will communally roost, but uh, tend to not be uh, like to be in groups during the breeding season. Um, they are monogamous. So, they do like to pair up. Um, they, like I said, they, they're very nervous and they like dense vegetation, um, will hunt in open habitat. So they do like to have like, like those lovely, uh, farm fields that have those lovely cedar hedges in between, or those evergreen trees in between are ideal kind of habitats for them. Um, breeding March to May, um, they prefer an openness instead of a cavity and they often take over Cooper's hawk's nests. 
Um, so you'll often see them kind of cohabitate with Cooper's hawks, even though that at some point they may predate each other's kids, um, but they can uh, kind of live in the same type of habitat um, and coexist with them. Um, prey on small rodents and birds, hunt on the wing, they will hover. And then here's some of their calls. And then we have a warning call. And then what I call a bark. So they do have a variety. So there's these ideas of like bird, of these owls only hooting or making hoo hoo noises. They do have a, quite a repertoire. Um, and then we have the shorty owl. Uh, the shorty owl closely related to the long-eared owl. And so it's just based on their tough lengths. And there's a bit of a coloration difference. Uh, this is a species of special concern. Um, there has been noted declines in their population over the past 40, 50 years. Um, and it's because of habitat loss. Um, they're, like I said, they like um, um, marshland, uh, bog land, um, prairies, open farmland. Um, they're also ground nesters. Um, so they compose a rest um, of uh, disrupted. So they're crepuscular. So their activity level is mostly dusk and dawn. Um, they're nomadic. They're not really a true migrant because they'll also make movements west to, to east and sometimes north to south. Um, they will communally roost as well. Um, they're monogamous, so they will um, seasonally breed together. Um, and but I don't think that there's uh, enough evidence out there to know if they actually uh, maintain a bond and move together in these movements. Um, we still need more data. Um, open habitats, like I said, meadows, marshlands. Um, but they again like to have those evergreen trees to roost in. Um, they often are seen in the similar habitat of the Northern Harrier, which is also uh, a species of special concern. Um, so breeding March to May, ground nesting. So they basically just create a deficit or a scrape uh, and lay their eggs in that type of um, uh, pocket. Um, and they, uh, small rodents and birds, um, hunt on the wing or will hover as well, just like the long ears. And here are some vocalizations that they like to make. That one I always think sounds like a party, like they're going, Meow! I'm going to play that one again. That's my favorite. And then this is uh, advertisement. So this is what we hear in the spring only. Announcing, hey, how about you check out my nest site? And then the alarm call. Oh. Again, just the little barks, little yips. Now the barn owl is also a species at rest. And so the barn owl uh, is basically disappearing from the landscape because of habitat loss. Um, they don't enjoy our winters. Actually, um, most owl species um, like this are feathered all the way down to their toes. Now, I do not have a, a barn owl specimen. I should actually try to get one done. Um, we might have one in the freezer we can show you. Um, uh, not today though. Um, uh, they don't have as much feathering down their legs. Their legs are more sparsely feathered. So they're not really equipped for our winters. Uh, and the reason why they used to be so abundant in our environment is that, you know, say a hundred years ago, everybody had a farm with a milking cow, sheep for wool, chickens, pigs, all in a barn that was nice and warm. And also too, food storage for the, the livestock wasn't well maintained. So there was always tons of rodents. And so it was a great place for them to hide in the winter for warmth as well as the food source. Um, so uh, that's why they actually were quite abundant and now we're losing them from the landscape because we all don't have our milking cow anymore. So um, there are still um, occasional sightings of barn owls in Ontario. Uh, so they're sedentary, so they do like to establish themselves, um, but they do think that our population might be a, a bit migratory, but again, still there's not enough evidence. Um, farmlands, open habitat with some trees. Um, they're, they actually can breed two to three times a year, depending on food densities. Um, so they, they're very, very happy to create families and they can produce a lot uh, of babies. Um, and they prefer uh, a cavity nest uh, or a, a cliff edge uh, inside barns, inside eaves. Um, so they do like more of a covered nest. Um, they are primary rodents, but they will take small bird and invertebrates. Um, they really enjoy a hovering type of flight. Um, uh, so they usually are hunting on the wing. They have exceptional ear hearing as well. 
Um, and uh, that's why they have that beautiful, um, or what I call a satellite face. So any of the birds that have this kind of almost look like a satellite dish are often very, uh, have good hearing. Um, and that, that's your prominent pr primary focus is actually listening is when they have these beautiful um, kind of satellite dish faces. Um, and uh, they're very distinct, the barn owl, because of that lovely heart-shaped face and their dark eyes. And they have a ridiculous uh, screen. Um, there's actually a better one online that just blood curling is like a horror, a horror film would probably enjoy using that scream. And then the babies actually produce a hissing sound if distressed. Um, so that was the chicks hissing at some point. And then here's our barred owl. So like I said, you know, I included them as a, a bit of life history so that we can um, review a little bit of what uh, we're seeing in the species for this area. So they're mainly nocturnal. But again, they like to claim an area and stay in that space. Um, they like to have partners and maintain that partnership all through the year. Um, they're mostly common in central and northern Ontario. So like if you do have, uh, you know, visit a cottage in the country, you may have he uh, heard their calls. Um, they prefer a mixed forest type. Um, their breeding is between March and May, have nest bird, but sometimes they're okay with the snag. Uh, they prey on rodents, small birds, and invertebrates, but they also um, will occasionally take rabbits. Um, so, um, and they hunt mainly from pieces. Um, they don't have feather tufts on top of their head. They have this nice smooth uh, head with the lovely dark eyes. And here's some of their calls. So this has a moniker of who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? Um, so, um, so you can remember if you're And then we have a nestling example call, what we consider calling a reap. So he's just doing a contact call to his family. Um, and so then we have the great horned owl. So this great horned owl, they're crepuscular, dusk and dawn. Um, they're more se they're sedentary. So once they claim a space, they maintain it throughout the year. They're monogamous. They pair up. Um, and they maintain that relationship throughout the year. And they have a broad range of habitats. In Toronto, every single golf course, I swear, has a horned owl nest. Um, or any of the larger parks will have a horned owl nest. So they're even in uh, the Toronto landscape. Uh, I feel sorry for any of the dispersing kids because they often have to go through quite a few um, city areas before they can find their own space because parents will kick them out. Um, so they're breeding, they're the earliest of the breeders uh, for this area. So they're the ones that will go to nest first, um, sometimes as early as January. Um, again, if they're an established breeding pair and they're a solid um, relationship, they'll often go earlier than the ones that are new. Um, and they're not picky. They'll take a, a, an existing nest, uh, often red tail nests, um, uh, squirrels, uh, drays, they'll, they'll take over as well as snags, sometimes even just ledge or rock ledge. Um, so they're going to be more diverse in their prey items. Um, so they'll utilize, um, you know, larger prey items as well. They hunt from perch ground and on the wing. Uh, and then here's uh, their protest call. So this is when they're annoyed with each other or even with us. And so this is a call that you'll often hear um, uh, during, especially during the breeding season, just kind of uh, announcing their territory so it wards off other horned owls. And you'll also hear this when the kids are starting to get kicked out. So you know, kids, and they cannot remind them that the kids are space now. And then the snowy owls. So during the winter months, we'll see some snowy owls in the southern Ontario. Um, so that's another large species of owl. Um, so these guys, um, they, their activity will depend on their hunger levels um, and what prey items they're kind of seeking out and what they're used to seeking out. Um, so if you think about it, they actually nest in the tundra. So during the tundra season, they're actually dealing with a lot of light levels. And so their light periods are quite long. Um, and then when they come to down here in the winter, um, you know, we have a lot more dark. Um, so they're very comfortable at any level of daylight, but their activity level is preferred to be during the, the dark, but it's not to say that they won't act during the day, it will be dependent on their hunger level and what opportunities come their way. Um, so they're considered like a nomadic species rather than a migratory species. So 
their movements aren't always uh, assured to be uh, moving every single year. Um, it will be dependent on what food sources are in their natural range. And then um, the hot years where it's called an eruption year, where um, it's kind of like a mass movement because there was a, a big drop there, right? Um, so they prefer open habitat. Um, so meadows, marshlands, um, they will hang out near lakes just because it does look like an open habitat in the winter, um, but they will feed off of, um, of uh, waterfowl and, and gulls and stuff. Uh, it's just, kind of hold them as staple, you know, but they do like the rodents as well. And they breed May to June. Um, they're seasonally monogamous, so they'll definitely partner up, but they may not have the same partner the next year. Lots of eggs if food is good. Um, ground nesters, so they're nesting on the ground in open spaces, open spaces, and a variety of prey items as well. Being a larger bird, they're going to take large prey items. Um, hunt on the winger from the perch, and then here's their calls. And then their advertisement call. And then their contact call. So again, not just a typical hoot. So just, uh, I did add this slide in, so it's probably why we're taking a bit long. Um, so a lot of people ask us how we can tell boys and girls apart. Other owl species, we can't, it's very hard. For some species, you might get some nuances of color tones, um, but for the snowy owls, you actually can tell them apart, males and females. Um, as the females mature, it may become more challenging to do like a sight on, in the wild type of look, um, but their tails are actually uh, quite different. Um, the females will tend to have a lot more barring across the, the base of their tails and the males will have less. Um, and then as a male matures, they get more and more white, but the female will always maintain some level of spotting. Um, the, the picture you see is a very mature female. So she did lose a lot of her spotting, um, but she still has a good portion of it. And she needs to be spotted because she's a ground nest going to help hunt in, whereas he is going to be up in the air doing a lot of hunting. So it's more advantageous to him to be more white. Um, and in the middle picture, you can see um, the difference between the first year boys and first year girls. The female looks much darker and densely colored than the boys. And uh, their markings are even thicker on the girls than the boys. And so how you can be owl friendly, again, you know, just do your part, don't litter. Um, even compostable garbage can pose a threat. So like if you're driving in your car and you have an apple car, if you throw it outside the window, it attracts wildlife to the roadsides, which leads to um, something's going to prey on the uh, on the items that are attracted to that apple. So um, so then you'll get your predators hunting on the roadside. Um, so just be mindful of that. Do not feed wildlife, keep them wild, educate your friends, um, helping build um, uh, roost boxes for them, especially if you have a newer forest nearby, you're not going to have abilities to have cavities in those trees. Um, and then uh, plant wildflowers, plant trees, support your conservation area, you know, uh, incentives in your area, um, keep viewing to a minimum when you're viewing your birds and use a cover or blind. These are ways you can be out friendly. Um, if you do find an injured animal, do not touch the animal. Uh, seek help first. Um, so there's a couple ways you can try to seek help. Um, most rehabbers um, have a connection to other rehabbers. So if it's not necessarily in their species, you can always say, hey, listen, I know you don't do the species, but who do you know? Um, but, um, you know, there is resources out there that you can seek uh, the appropriate help for the appropriate species. And so the information we're looking for is just, you know, what are you seeing in the environment? And always be safe if it's on the roadside, especially off of a highway. If you call OPP and say, listen, there's a lot of people slowing down, risking their lives to assist this animal, then they have to come in and help. And so they'll usually contact the Humane Society and together they'll hope, hopefully safely remove that animal. So just try not to do highway or space yourself with people who have been hurt by that. Um, and keeping your distance until help arrives. Sometimes you might get, uh, uh, you know, some instructions uh, to, help, you know, to help secure the animal, especially if, if a rehabber is too far away. But wait for those instructions and just remember the animal's frightened. So even if it's not fighting you back or um, acting fearful, it is fearful. And it may just be too injured or, or weak to actually put his defenses up. Um, so just keep that in mind. Oh, and I forgot the one slide. Um, and if you find a baby animal, it may not need help. So definitely seek somebody out. Um, because sometimes during their first attempts at flights, they're going to find themselves on the ground and they're going to stay on the ground for another two to three days before they're able to get actually good lift and, and loft in order to give, 
keep them from, 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 from harm and safety. And so we're big proponents of keeping your cats indoors or keeping your cats leashed. My cat is leash trained as well as get a lovely ride in a backpack. Um, because especially during the spring, a lot of wildlife is very vulnerable and uh, easy targets for cats. And so, it, you know, when you see that data, those are factual data. Those are rehabbers putting out that data out saying, you know, yeah, another cat attack, another cat attack, another cat attack. Um, because the, you know, the distressed owners like, oh my God, you brought me this baby bird or this baby owl. Um, so th those are, those are true data points. Um, so try to be respectful of wildlife. Um, and bells don't work. Cats are really good at keeping that bell, bell pretty stationary as they're stalking. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, just seek help for babies. Um, and so that's our wild conclusion. That was the lovely release that uh, happened. Um, so now we'll, um, um, We'll take some questions while I dissect this lovely pellet. So we can do two things at once. So I'm going to. So if you want to go ahead and start uh, shooting me out some questions, I'm going to do. Um, oh, yeah. See, I'm so used to bare handing it. I'm going to do the proper thing. So if you do find a pellet in the wild, it's very good to either wear gloves or make sure you wash your hands afterwards. So I'm going to do the proper thing. <laughs> and I'm going to put my gloves on uh, while I dissect it. So any questions? Yes. Um, do you want to turn off your screen share just so people can see your face rather than the? Yeah. Hang on. I'm going to stop the share and then you can see me better. Perfect. Um, the way while I try to tear up into this yeah. yummy. So food. we do have a question. Um, how long does it take for an owl to mature from owlet to being a full grown? Oh, owl? it's very quick. Um, so we go by uh, basically three to four weeks for each stage. So the time they come out of their egg at three to four weeks um they are starting to branch out so they're strong enough and wanting to practice so they'll actually start going off the nest and then three to four weeks after that um they're no sorry three to four weeks that they're nest bound three to four weeks then they're branching so they're moving about in the branches flapping their wings and then at another three to four weeks they're actually able to do short flights six to feet, feet and then at, at uh, basically about 10 to 12 weeks they're actually fully flighted. So but at eight weeks, they're actually the same size of their parents. Oh, wow. By four, by four to six weeks, they're the same height of their parents. That is very fast, which yeah. is a good segue to the next question. Um, is there a size difference between male and female for most species? Um, it's mostly the girls that are bigger. Um, it's actually a matri matriarchal society in the owl world. So uh, most of them are the dominant species. Like they're, they're the ones that kind of decide who gets to mate with who. And, uh, and so they tend to be larger. In some species, the difference is slight. Um, and they do think that for burrowing owls, for some reason, and hawk owls, it might be opposite. They actually might have the males bigger, but uh, for the rest of the species, the females are bigger. So I did find a little piece of jawbone, but that's not as easy. Sometimes you can find whole skulls. So go to the next one. I'll keep digging. <laughs> Uh, so a question about the facility um, that you work at there in Vineland. How many owls do you have at a time? And also how many would you have in an average year? Okay, so um, because we specialize, um, our numbers aren't going to be like big like the other centers, but we do take in about um, about 150 to 200 birds a year. Um, so currently we have, I believe, 35 rehab cases on property right now at different stages. So there's a lot of fur in this, but not a lot of bone a lot of fur so we're going to move to the next pellet and hope we get something juicy like i feel a little like a couple little um like here's like some type of bone i'm hoping for a small for you guys anyways next question yeah uh so uh, i think we answered the question but the the males snowy owl yes is darker. Yeah. yeah yeah so the the female's darker and and uh the the, the girls are are larger Oh, this was a very boring pellet. It's mostly fur. Uh, so I believe this is in Toronto, but Thixon's Woods in High Park lost a great horned owl this year. Will another yes. pair move in, like a new, a new partner, or what sort of will happen? In that? Yeah. So, so um, when when a, a a vacancy happens in a habitat, um, yeah. So eventually he's going to start growing again. If it was female. I'm not sure. I do think it was female, but I don't know if we get confirmation of that. So what's going to happen is that he's going to start announcing a call like sometimes it's calling for hit her to come back um but he's going to start announcing like hey i have a nest available you know does anybody want to join me and so somebody might come into his area and say i'm interested in what you got and let's see 
And so he may have to prove himself again. Um, but every season, even a mated pair, they still have to kind of prove themselves. So he'll still go through the ritual of presenting food at the nest site, um, doing vocalizations, you know, um, some um, bird species will do like a flight displays to show how strength, you know, how strong and, and uh, fit they are. Um, so they, you know, when it, when a mate does die, um, there is a period of time where they're kind of looking for familiar, but eventually they will have a, a mate get replaced. Awesome. Uh, and then we've got someone wondering, what is your favorite owl? Do you have a favorite or do you not play favorites? Um, I used to not play favorites. I used to be very political and say, oh, they're all special in their own way. Um, <laughs> but they are truly have different personalities, um, especially in care. You know, uh, I mean, most of uh, like we, we don't habituate our animals. They're all wild. But even in their wildness, they have personality traits, different levels of adjustment, different acceptables, and just even just what behaviors they like to portray and what they like to do. Um, long story, you know, long, long, uh, long answer for uh, I do. I do like the short ones. Shorty dolls are one of my favorites. We won't tell anybody. Yes. <laughs> Don't tell the birds. <laughs> Everybody gets equal care and attention. But I do. I do have a little. Um, then we have, someone's wondering, um, how can you, they contribute not to encourage baiting? And if they do see someone baiting, like how do they um, stop or what sort of their best practices in that? Situation? Yeah. So for your area, if you do know there's a bylaw that exists, you can call a bylaw officer enough for assistance. Um, but it can get pretty aggressive out there. Like I've heard reports of people trying to stick up to get threatened, you know, so you can always be safe, but you can always try to educate and just, you know, the, the, the statements I made about being and how it can alter behavior. You can say it. Some people will receive the information and, and think about it and maybe stop. And some people will just, you know, you're full of crap and, and not consider it. So um, just always trying to pursue, you know, education, but still be safe. Like, like I said, I've seen people where their, their tires were, you know, they were threatening to puncture their tires over something, you know, as simple as just trying to educate somebody. So just be safe, but definitely just keep pursuing that and just saying, hey, but hey, if, if it is a bylaw in your area that it's not allowed, then reach out to your bylaw officers. Hey, I, I reported this. And especially if you can tell the bylaw officers, like I've seen them three days in a row at the site around this time, then it at, le at least assist them as to how to better but, you know, uh, report that and, and do proper um, investigation and perhaps find them. Oh, that sounds like a good, for, good first steps. Um, how big are the pellets? I, I would imagine they range based on the- So size. they range. So like, sometimes they're like this big. It depends on what you're consuming. So like, I've had like a short ear produce a pellet that would look like from a horned owl. And then I've had a horned owl because it only ate a little bit, had a small pellet. Um, so it does range. So you can't really say that, oh, this pellet is from this size owl and it's from this type of owl. You can't. Um, so you can look at the, maybe the habitat. You can look at maybe potentially what it ate. Like this, this pellet had like tons of fur in it. So I'm assuming that all this fur came from, it almost looks squirrel-like or even rabbit-like. I would say it's actually probably rabbit fur. It's very fine, um, easily matted, soft. Um, so I'm thinking that this was probably part of a rabbit that cons consumed and, and I'm not finding any bones. So the larger the prey item, the more chances that they're only grabbing fur and meat, not the whole chunk of a leg and, and consuming a bone. Um, so when they're doing just like rodent pellets that you, you can find the whole skeleton of a, of a rodent inside a pellet. Um, so, uh, yeah, so they range in sizes. Um, and do and do so they do migrate some species do migrate but to some stage yes. yeah so i think you were talking about that and yeah besides um and then uh nicole's wondering do you accept volunteers at your facility like how can we support the wild foundation or what's the process yeah so there's a couple of ways like unfortunately because we're, we're our numbers are so small our physical needs for help are mostly in the unfavorable sector of mouse rodent care um, and so we do have a mouse house where we maintain a colony of mice and we want them to be, you know, having their best life there. So we make sure that their basins are clean on a regular basis. You know, we give them like um, you know, paper towel tubes and things to hide in and nest in um, while they're breeding as well. So, so that's mainly where the help is required, but we also do have a driver program. So the driver program consists of having a list of volunteers in a big massive database. And so we do have like, I think 500 on the list and it's all ranging through all of Ontario. And so how we decide who we're gonna call is they could say it's like Tuesday at 10 a.m. 
and it's in Barry, we'll look in Barry first and we'll go, okay, who in Barry is not working on a Tuesday available in the morning? And so we'll look down and it's got columns. And so we'll go, oh yeah, look, they're weekends only. So we won't bother calling them, but they're weekdays. So let's try to call them if they're available. And so um, we'll have kind of a convoy of drivers. So we might have somebody going from Barrie to Toronto and then Toronto to Vineland. So if even if you're local and you can get on this driver's list and what you what you can do is give us information like, oh, I'm available weekends or I'm only available weekend, uh, week, weekdays. And you can give us a rough idea of the length of time you want to drive. So if you say, hey, all the way, I'll drive for eight hours there, eight hours back, I don't care. Or you can say, you know what, I only want to do two hours of driving total. So that would be an hour radius that you're willing to drive. So as long as you're clear and just because we call you doesn't mean that you have to stop everything. That's why we like to have multiple people on the list because there's times it takes us 50 calls before we'll have somebody available because they have plans or they have appointments or, you know, they're not comfortable with the weather conditions that are currently and we have to respect it and we totally do. So it's nice to have multiple people on that list. So if you're interested, you can email us and we'll send you a form that you can fill out and uh, let us know your availability, but it's on your gas and on your insurance. Um, so we can't provide anything, but that's a great way to help. And you can help many uh, rehabbers by, by being on, the, on their list. So if you're not local to us, but you want to help another rehab center, reach out to them. Uh, driving is a big crucial part of, of trying to get the animal there. And sometimes if you become a really uh, like a, a long-term driver for us, then we remember you. And then sometimes they'll get released. <laughs> so if you are dedicated and you follow instructions well, you don't open the box, you don't hear birds, um, you know, you don't have loud music or let your dogs in the box, you might be able to do a fun release on the way back. Awesome. Um, and do you, like in, in the nest, do all the eggs typically survive or was there like a? Again, like nature, nature is tough. So, um, so it depends again, the health of the female. Um, it depends sometimes the timing. Um, we can get nitty gritty on, on, uh, on, on the actual procedure of how uh, eggs are fertilized, <laughs> but there's times the timing is off and the eggs don't get fertilized because um, the eggs are actually fertilized before it gets shelled. Um, so the timing of when they get fertilized is crucial. So if they're off for some reason, or if they're being mobbed or disrupted during the breeding season, they may not be cycling right, and they may not have an opportunity to actually fertilize the eggs. So you might have a mo mom go to nest, you may lay four eggs, they might be all that. Um, or you can have them have all four eggs hatch, but prey might be a little scarce. Um, so, uh, you know, it all depends. And also genetics, as, as anybody ages, and as the bird ages, the, the, you know, they may not be producing eggs that are viable or as healthy as they should be. So you could have failure to thrive on some of these chicks just because of the genetics of the, of, of the birds. Perfect. Um, and this is just, you know, uh, one of my questions, um, are there yeah. your rehabilitation, but is there like a citizen science project or things where you can help with counts or things like that um, in the Niagara? Yeah. So there's actually a Christmas bird count uh, where you can take part of um, identifying birds in your area. And so they are pretty well organized and they, if you're new to birding or um, want to get into birding, um, they usually will pair you up with a, 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 like a, a, a professional or a uh, somebody who's really good at it. Um, and even just running any of your nature clubs, if you're really interested into um, learning about nature and learning what kind of flora and fauna you have in your area, just joining your local nature club, they usually try to plan outings um, to kind of connect with nature um, and learn what's in your area. Um, it's a great way to meet like-minded people too. Um, and then if you're way, way up north, they do have uh, um, owl surveys that they um, uh, kind of train people to do and this is where they're using owl calls, but they're doing it in a very scientific, um, ethical way. Um, but basically, Northern Ontario, they're trying to identify where the nest sites are and what species are there. And so um, I'm not sure if that's still active, but they were doing that. So if you do like to go way up north in the wintertime, I think they do it in the winter. They, I, I can't remember a long time ago. They did that. So that's another option that you might be able to help. Perfect. Um... Guys, are there are any more questions? We're getting lots of accolades. So thank you everyone for your kind words. Um, oh, yeah. Um, if anyone has any further questions, please pop them into the chat. Yeah, and like I mentioned in the beginning, if uh, we run out of time and, and we can't get through your chat question or we missed it because of the scrolling of all the all the comments or whatever, and you have a question, just uh, reach out to our Facebook messenger um, and we'll try to answer it in a timely manner. Of course, we always prioritize any um, owls and stress calls or anything like that first, but uh, we'll try to get to your question. 
Yeah. Um, uh, yes, the video will be available on uh, the library's YouTube channel, which I will be posting tomorrow and emailing everyone. Mm -hmm. asking. Um, and then um, someone's wondering if there's a list of rehab facilities. Yeah, so on Ontario.ca, if you type in the search for wildlife rehabilitation, I don't know how up to date it is, um, but um, there is a list there and it will categorize what they actually cover. And you have to understand that these facilities are not supported by your municipality. It's through a public donations. And sometimes we can go after certain grants and stuff like that, but we don't get citizen money. So we don't get money from your mm -hmm. municipality or anything like that to operate. Um, so be patient. Um, and also, like, we have to set limits because um, we want to make sure that the birds and animals in our care are um, given the best quality care. And if we stretch ourselves too thin and add too many animals, then it compromises everybody. So there are times near the end of certain uh, breeding seasons, like um, you know, where, where they're saying, oh, sorry, we're full of squirrels. We can't take any more squirrels. Um, and, uh, but we can take that squirrel in and unfortunately we can, you know, um, um, end it suffering, um, but we're full. And we really encourage people not to do the care themselves. Googling how to care for animals is not gonna give you the right advice. Um, malnutrition is a, serious, serious concern when people try to take uh, care of animals themselves. And it often leads to malnourished suffering animals. And so we do not recommend you following Google advice, but also too, you don't want to habituate the animals. So there's certain steps we can do to, if you're to, uh, to, to reduce the patient, which is making them able. And then um, there's certain species like raccoons um, that carry um, diseases that can affect your pet as well as affect your children. Um, so, um, so it's very important because they're, 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 they're um, parasites that affect, doesn't affect their, their bodies the same way as it affects ours. And so it's just very important that you follow the advice from the rehabber. So if they're full and they, they recommend that, you know what, like it, it, you know, we need to do a tough decision here. Um, don't try to take care of yourself. Not a good idea. Even with uh, birds of prey too, like uh, often people want to feed it right away. We always say, do not provide food or water. There's a reason because if a bird is emaciated and you try to feed it whole foods, um, even if it's the right food that it's supposed to be getting, their body can't digest it, and whatever energy they had left just to pump up their, pump their heart and 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 feed their organs is being wasted on digestion. So we have an easily digestible diet that we provide them, and we also have to hydrate first. We don't even give calorie the first 12 hours. We're just hydrating it, giving it fluids, try to get everything working again. So. Um, you know, it's so important that you know, you have to get uh, experienced advice first before stepping uh, forward and trying to care for wildlife yourself. Uh, That's my uh, soapbox there. <laughs> Sorry, no, I'll get on. That's awesome. And uh, we did point out uh, Urban Wildlife Care in Grimsby does help with some other small uh, small animals and whatnot. So that's another local organization. Yeah. Um, also, yeah. making sure yeah. um, people are aware of, uh, as you said, um, you're not funded by municipalities. So um, any support, I'm sure, is always welcome to. Yeah, yeah, any financial support, or you can even reach out to any rehabber and say, hey, what is your most consumable goods? You know, is it paper towel? Is it cleaning supplies? Do you need towels? Like if you have towels that, you know what, you're changing your towels and you don't like the color anymore and you're changing towels, often we need towels. Um, some organizations love blankets. We don't use blankets, but I know that most mammal rehabbers love like, especially um, fleece blankets, especially for squirrels. They'll cut them up into the squares because it feels like mama's fur. So like, you know, for the babies and they only usually have one season of use, so they're throwing them out afterwards. So if you have spare fleece blankets and stuff, you can reach out and say, hey, do you have any now? If they say, no, we're not right now, you say, hey, I can hold on to it until you need it, you know, so that they, you know, because sometimes storage is a problem. But just reach out and say, hey, what do you need? What's your consumables? And help out that way. Perfect. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through okay. this and we are at 7.45. So I think we're going to wrap up there. So um, just- okay, excellent. Um, so thank you, Anik. Um, as I said, I'll no send problem. an email um, with the recording and some uh, any information that Anik shares and her contact information at the well, the, the foundation's contact information, um, mm -hmm. as well as some information about library stuff. We have binoculars, we have uh, NPCA day passes and Ontario Parks passes, all that you can borrow for free with your library card. So great resources to get out there and ethically bird and making sure we're not disturbing our wildlife that we share this beautiful area with. Yeah, excellent. Thank you again for everyone for joining us tonight. Um, please feel free to share any feedback via email or social media or however you want to connect. Um, thank you again, Anik, for all the work that you do. No after problem. And for everybody have a good night. Community and everyone have a safe and well, not safe, have a good evening at home. And we'll see you all soon. Take care. Take care.